All right, it is 12.30, at least on one of my clocks. Um, so we'll get started here. Just as a reminder, next week, Thursday, is our test. Um, if you already browse through the, the slides I posted uh, this morning, you'll see that there is a spot, just like in test one, where halfway through the slides or whatever, I say, this is the end of test two material. Um, at least I hope I put that version off, which reminds me that the material for test two, that's the test two folder, but also remember the last PowerPoint in test one, we had that cutoff where we're saying, uh, you know, everything before this would be on test one, everything after this will be in test two. So please don't uh, forget that. And let me just close my window as I'm sure you don't want to hear barking dog uh, for two. All right. So what we're going to talk about for the first part of today is um, regulation of basically all the processes we've talked about up to this point in the class. So first, let's just talk about the speed of oxidative phosphorylation. And here we're talking about NADH to cytochrome C. So basically complex one to complex three, because if you remember, that in um, complex three, we do the Q cycle where we take our QH2 and we give an electron to cytochrome C and we do that twice. And we're doing this pathway instead of NADH to oxygen because once you give an electron to cytochrome C, that is irreversible. Um, everything else before you go to cytochrome C is reversible. Um, with ATP, uh, but once once you're past that cytochrome C stage and onto complex four, that's when you really can't go um, in the reverse pathway. So here's our overall equation again, basically at equilibrium, and KEQ products over reactants. Um, what what I want you to focus on for this equation is just what ratios really. Uh, matter in our uh, KEQ equation. And that is the ratios of NADH to NAD and ATP to ADP. That's, that's what's really going to be determining how fast oxidative phosphorylation goes. And we talked about this concept already uh, for the citric acid cycle uh, in terms of NADH. But for oxidative phosphorylation, the more NADH you have, the faster you will go. While more ADP you have, the faster you'll go. All based on this KEQ calculation. Um, but yeah, just keep that in mind. Oxidative phosphorylation goes its fastest when you have a lot of NADH and a lot of ADP. So that's what the higher ratio means, right? So you want a whole number here and you want a fraction here, a low ratio. So that's, that's what's determining um, the speed of oxidative phosphorylation. So here's a little um, critical thinking, connecting this to the wide world of medicine and all that. So. There is a molecule out there called 2,4-dinitrophenol. It's illegal now, but it used to be illegal, I want to say, like in the 50s. And it's a weight loss drug. Now, it has some side effects, including nausea, vomiting, sweating, dizziness, headache, and death, you know, all the fun ones. And the way that this works is that DNP, what it does, is allows for hydrogens to go from the intermembrane space to the matrix by bypassing ATP synthesis. Knowing of all the biochemistry we've talked about so far, 
how does DNP speed up metabolism to actually make you lose weight then? So how is this all connected? How does blocking ATP synthase make you lose weight? What's the connection there? Less ATP gets made, correct? Because that's that's what's going on here, right? So we're not making ATP anymore. Does it block glycogen storage? Um, possibly that could be a side effect. Yes, but let's think about it in terms of like storage itself, right? So. Let's 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 um, kind of like we're gonna go small and then kind of piece it together. So, as was pointed out, and as we talked about, matrix uh, intermembrane space (IMS). Normally, with oxidative phosphorylation complex one, three, and four, take hydrogens from the matrix and pump them into the inner membrane space where you have a lot of hydrogens uh, hanging out. Normally what happens is ATP synthase. I'm just gonna call that S. Hydrogens go through here through the F0 and F1. They, they go on that mer mer uh, merry-go-round of the C protein and they have the three different states remember uh, to make ATP. However, DMP, what DMP does is block this. It's a big block right there. And instead they can now just go in there. I guess I, it's a little disingenuous. It doesn't block this more so that it allows this. And so ATP synthase is not just gonna run. So the amount of ATP and your body goes down. And as we've learned, when ADP, ATP goes down, cyclic AMP is gonna go up. The reason for this is that you're not remaking ATP. So any ATP in your cells, you're gonna use and not replenish it. So it's all gonna turn into cyclic AMP. One of the things that cyclic AMP does Turns on glycolysis, turns on the citric acid cycle. So you're gonna start breaking down fat. You're gonna start breaking down your glycogen. You're gonna start breaking down your muscles because you are continuously sending out the signal of low energy because you don't have ATP around. The only problem is you keep running glycolysis, citric acid cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, and at the very end, you don't make ATP. So the signal just keeps getting propagated, keep going this low energy signal. And that is why DNP, one of the side effects is death, because if you keep taking it, you will never replenish your ATP um, and then you'll just die. But, you know, it would lose weight, although it's super dangerous to use. Um, because of that concept, how everything's connected here. So does that make sense on um, our, our connection between oxidative phosphorylation, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, how different uh, signals can show different things? Or any questions about that explanation?
So DMP was speed up because there's an increase in cyclic a speed up metabolism. Yeah, and there's an increase in cyclic AMP because your ATP is being used and not replenished. Um, so that's why there would be a buildup of both ADP and cyclic AMP. Yep. So I guess I should also write that with cyclic AMP. Uh, ADP also goes up, which are both uh, signals in the body for low energy. And then energy storage goes in here. You'd use your stores of energy, mainly your fat, uh, glycogen, muscles to break down to try and make ATP. What about the pH inside versus outside? Um, what would probably happen to that is you could probably still maintain a gradient somewhat because even though this is allowing that to go through, you would still be actively pushing out hydrogens through complex one, three, and four. I would guess that the pH gradient would not be um, that great compared to not taking DMP, just because you pump one out and you, it's going right back in. But I would imagine you could probably still uh, keep that gradient. And like I said, when I, when I was uh, drawing this and I said it blocked DMP and then I, was, then I uh, said, actually, no, it doesn't do that. Um, you could still make small amounts of ATP while doing this because some hydrogens are still going to naturally go through ATP synthase. You just slow down production a lot by using a drug like this. That would be my best best guess on that. I actually don't know 100%, but that's that's what I would logic out. Any other questions or comments or anything? All right. So now let's move on to regulation. And we're going to talk about the regulatory protein IF1. IF1 is a small protein, only 84 residues, but it is the molecule that regulates ATP synthase. And if everything's working normal, and you have like a high pH in the mitochondria. IF is an inactive tetramer. However, if your pH drops to below 6.5, then what the protein will do is it will go from a tetramer. I guess I could probably draw this out. So inactive, it's in the tetramer, tetramer form. If the pH is below 6.5, this breaks into dimers. So it breaks into two dimers. Inactive versus active. And what this does is that it will go and this and it's actually being shown right here, it will wedge itself into alpha and beta subunits of ATP synthase. And it will do it into the ADP form. That's what that DP stands for. Stands for it's the subunits that already have ADP bound. In one second, since I have my windows open, I have allergens float. Hopefully I won't sneeze again for, for a couple minutes here. So 
the active dimer goes and wedges itself in between the alpha and beta subunit. And the way I think about this is that if you remember the ATPase, it's like a giant turbine that spins in a, a circle. This protein is a stick that you just stick in there and it doesn't turn anymore. It's like an actual protein wedge. So you can no longer uh, change conformations. So you're stuck. And the logic of this is that we learned that ATP synthase, so I'm gonna draw again my little crude picture. So we have this mysterious uh, A subunit that nobody knows what looks what it looks like. We have the F0 and then we have the F1, right? So this is intermembrane space. This is a matrix, right? So the way that this works is that a hydrogen goes to the A subunit goes to F0, rides this all the way around in a circle, comes out the other part of the A subunit and goes into the matrix. Doing this makes um, the F1 and the alpha and beta, beta subunits change conformation and you get ATP out. That's normally how it works. However, there's no reason whatsoever that this can't run backwards. So the black is the forward reaction and the, and the reverse reaction is that a hydrogen goes from the matrix, goes the, around the other way, goes into the intermembrane space and you're using ATP to do this and you make ADP. So you burn ATP to do nothing um, and that can happen if the pH in the matrix becomes really low. So to prevent that, that's what IF1 is doing. IF1, I guess I'll go to the blue here. IF1, this is an alpha and this is a beta subunit. as shown in the picture there, IF1 becomes active at low pHs, goes and interacts with the F1 subunit. And that's how we can prevent our ATP synthase from running backwards. And that usually happens when you're low oxygen. Any questions about our regulation protein IF1 when it's activated or uh, any, any of the uh, information I just went over there? All right. And if you're still typing on, if I like move past the slide and you still have a question about it, uh, feel free to continue to ask the question. When I see it pop up in the chat, I'll, I'll gladly go back to it. So that's the control of um, ATP synthase. Now let's just go back, take a step back and look at control of the entire glycolysis citric acid cycle mechanism. And we already talked about these individually and I made mention of this before um, when I was talking about citrate, but here is all the molecules that pretty much turn on or turn off uh, glycolysis in the citric acid cycle. And this is all deeply tied into uh, oxidative phosphorylation. Um, we mentioned this when we were talking about uh, NADH. One of the things that turns off the citric acid cycle is the amount of NADH you have. So the higher NADH that will shut this off, um, which will also actually turn off oxidative phosphorylation. So NADH turns on oxphos, but it, the citric acid cycle turns that off. which kind of makes sense, right? NADH, we want to harvest that for energy, but if we have a lot of it already, that means we're going to have a lot of energy soon. So we can use those citric acid cycle intermediates for other processes 
use the NADH and oxidophosphorylation, change that into ATP, then when NADH drops low again, restart the citric acid cycle to replenish that. But there are just a lot of different enzymes listed here that are just um, regulated uh, by uh, different mechanisms here. Uh, one of the big ones I talked about already, um, but I'll mention it again, citrate. Citrate is created in the citric acid cycle, but it goes and inhibits uh, PFK. So again, citrate, if you have that around, that means you have a lot of energy. So stop one of the major control points of glycolysis, PFK. So you can use intermediates um, for other things as well. We have direct control by ATP as well. So uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase turned on by ADP and alpha, uh, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is turned off by ATP. So there's a direct control of energy, uh, ATP and ADP as well. And so if you go, Let's say that you're in the situation where you have a lot of ATP, all right? So ADP concentration is very high. What will happen is that alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase will stop. So it'll we'll stop right here. And remember, the citric acid cycle, for the most part, except the first reaction, is generally reversible. So you will reach equilibrium. With all of these um, uh, metabolites, except citrate, because citrate can leave the cell. So citrate leaves cell. and inhibits PFK. And that will have the effect of creating more citrate because of the Chatelier's principle, when you take away a substrate, uh, chemistry will always change to go and make more of that substrate. So um, it's kind of like an, an enforcing effect. You have a lot of ATP due to oxidative phosphorylation, stop alpha ketoglutarate. Then you'll make citrate because of equilibrium. Citrate will leave the cell. You'll make more citrate and you'll keep making citrate to propagate that signal of we are high energy. And the only way to stop this is for your ATP levels to go down again and your ADP levels will increase because in the reverse case, where I guess I'll write it up here. So ATP goes down, whoops, which means ADP goes up, then isocitrate dehydrogenase turns on. And alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase turns on, aka G. They both turn on, that means you run the citric acid cycle incomplete because there's nothing blocking it now. So that's, that's kind of um, some more in-depth regulation and how everything, everything we've talked about in this class up to this point, they're all interconnected. Even though we learn them as individual cycles, we only do that to help break it down into pieces easier to uh, understand. Again, something I've said before, everything is just interconnected. Everything is not really a part of each other. ATP uh, stops isocitric dehydrogenase. Yes, that's correct too. Um, it's not on this picture, but yeah, ATP would also stop isocitrate dehydrogenase. So I guess in that example, what I should say here is 
isocitrate dehydrogenase will also stop, which just means you stop one step earlier and you're still just making citrate though. And then citrate leaves and you keep making citrate. Yep, which still goes back to citrate, that is correct. Any other questions? All right. So let's look at this whole process, start to finish in terms of just straight up chemical equations. When comparing aerobic to anaerobic metabolism, you gain 30 more ATP just by the introduction of oxygen. Start with the same starting material of glucose, two ATP if you have no oxygen, 32 ATP if you do have oxygen. So that's why, you know, just speaking on an evolutionary scale, why oxygen breathing organisms have come to dominate the world for the most part. But there are a lot of drawbacks. Oxygen is a poison. Uh, if you have what are called free radicals, and I'm kind of jumping on my point, so. Uh, so free radicals is when you just have um, molecules that have an uneven number of electrons. And what they do is that they can go and ruin DNA or ruin proteins. And so one of the reasons why we think that we age is that as you breathe day in, day out, you just create free radicals. And those are what is what is due to your like um, your skin getting more saggy. And it's also thought to be the whole aging process. You're just, you just kind of break down your body from the inside by, uh, by these free radicals. You nick your DNA, you nick different proteins um, and just years and years and years of that go by and it just starts to wear down on your body. Um, also Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, again, that these are diseases that are thought to have some kind of link to mitochondria getting damaged uh, through oxygen. Mitochondria is going to be the uh, part in your cell that gets damaged the most because it's where we're actually doing oxidative phosphorylation. But actually jumping back up to my other points here, um, one of the drawbacks of needing oxygen is that if you don't have it, you die uh, very fast. Um, even after a couple minutes without oxygen, you will have great damage to your body because we have just, our cells just need so much energy, um, which is fine if we have oxygen to make that energy. You take that away for you know four or five minutes, uh, that's gonna cause a lot of damage. Um, reactive oxygen species, that's what I was talking about here. Uh, where you have a negatively charged um, electron. Like I said, lipid structure, DNA, uh, enzyme functions can all, all be affected by these uh, ROSs or reactive oxygen species. So how do we protect ourselves from the dangers of metabolism? And that is through antioxidants, which since the late 80s, early 90s, has been um, one of the most favorite buzzwords when marketing foods or supplements. Um, and I, I did a little research about this uh, just this morning, uh, preparing uh, just to see, you know, why are anti antioxidants such a big thing? And it's due to research in the, in the 80s where scientists first saw that uh, what a um, antioxidant is, is that they help to prevent damage by these free radicals. One enzyme 
in your body is called superoxide dismutase, SOD. Um, I actually mentioned this very briefly in Biochem 1 in saying that SOD is an enzyme that is like the fastest enzyme in your body. And what it does is that it takes a reactive oxygen species and changes it into hydrogen peroxide. And this reaction is called diffusion controlled limited. What that means is that this enzyme, the slowest part of this enzyme is finding a free radical. That's the slowest part is purely diffusion. And when you look at the speed of sod, it's actually faster than what you would predict due to diffusion only. That's because sod has evolved in such a way that it has like a zone, and that's kind of what I'm showing here. It has a zone to go and attract negative charges. So as a copper ion, has an arginine, and has a, a lysine and a bunch of other groups to help hydrogen bond and guide negatively charged species into it. And these arrows are trying to show like, uh, you know, uh, uh, polarity, trying to show you that if a negative charge comes in, it's gonna be dragged right to this arginine 143. But that's just one. You also have catalase, which will, once we make the hydrogen peroxide breaks it down. Uh, glutathione also helps to break down that hydrogen peroxide and helps to keep this reaction moving forward. There are a lot of other antioxidants out there, um, a lot, vitamin C, vitamin E. Um, and I thought I changed this today. Um, I, I, so let me, let me make an asterisk to this. Whoops, I am not drawing anything because it's white. There we go. So here's my actress to this statement. Um, when taking antioxidants in supplement form, like taking vitamin C, vitamin E, or any just pure antioxidant in a pill, there is little to no support, scientific support that does anything for your body in helping to prevent damage by antioxidants. Um, and just for, uh, just let you know where I'm getting my source on this, I was searching through the Harvard, um, Harvard uh, webpage that had information about antioxidants on this. So um, from them looking at the research, if you take like vitamin C pills, vitamin E, it's not doing anything for you. But if you eat foods that are high in vitamin C, vitamin E, those do show that they will help prevent certain diseases that are, or lower the chances of certain diseases that are caused by antioxidants. And the idea there is that, you know, these, these foods that you eat, they, are, they have a lot of complex chemicals, a lot of different uh, molecules in there, and they're working together um, to actually um, be an antioxidant. While if you just take one molecule away from the food and just eat that alone, it doesn't have the supporting players to um, be really an antioxidant. So it, more of the story is um, don't be um, fooled by like things that say, now with a thousand milligrams of vitamin C, so antioxidant power, um, you really need that, that complex um, diet to really take uh, full benefit of antioxidants to help prevent uh, uh, reactive oxygen species from metabolism. But are there any questions about Ross's or anything we have covered up to uh, this point today? All right, can move on then.
So here's a um, another another question for us. So it has been shown in experiments with like mice that if you reduce the amount of food they eat, like if you restrict their calories by a third or like even a half, the lifespan of these mice increases dramatically. Um, like the lifespan like doubles, if not more, if you make sure they don't eat that much food. And so what happens is that when you cut off the amount of food you're eating, your body can take amino acids and use that as fuels. In that process, glutamate goes to alpha ketoglutarate. And what can happen is that sometimes alpha ketoglutarate can bind to the beta subunit of ATP synthase, not allow ATP synthase to run. So based on this, what do you think would happen if you have increased alpha ketoglutarate on oxygen consumption in the production of reactive oxygen species? And does that help explain why if you eat a lot less, you can live a lot longer, at least in mice? Let me just start drawing out this, this, this idea again. So you can use amino acids and to get energy, you convert them basically into alpha ketoglutarate. And alpha ketoglutarate can bind to and inhibit ATP synthase. So the idea here is, is that if ATP synthase isn't running, then what could happen is that the, um, the whole uh, oxidative phosphorylation machinery could slow down. And since you're not running oxidative phosphorylation much, then the oxygen to water that we saw at the very last step of um, oxidative phosphorylation, that won't happen as much either. And if you aren't giving oxygen's electrons, then you are lowering the amount of reactive oxygen species. So that is kind of like the central theory if you've ever heard about that before, is that if you eat drastically less food and it, it is a lot like a third less calories. So if you need to have 2000 calories, like let's just take that baseline, right? So for this to have any effect, you'd be looking at 1200 calories a day, which I don't recommend, don't do that to yourself. But the idea of why people say that if you do that for mice, they live a lot longer, is that you're slowing down metabolism. And when you slow down metabolism, and this question is just kind of getting at one of the ways metabolism could be slowed down, but you're slowing down metabolism. Since that's happening, you're not running oxidative phosphorylation as much. Since you're not running oxidative phosphorylation, you're not producing reactive oxygen species. Since you're not making reactive oxygen species, you're not having oxidative damage, aging process slows down, you have a longer lifespan. So that's kind of what this question is getting at and kind of that whole theory in like 20 seconds of why, why we see that result. Um, but if you're interested in that type of research, definitely, definitely look that up. It's really interesting, um, 
interesting studies on metabolism that they're doing with, with mice at this point. But any, any questions about that idea or anything at all up to this point? Right. That's it. So test two material will be up to um, oxidative phosphorylation. What we're going to talk about for the rest of today and a little bit on Tuesday will not be on test two, but will be on test three. And what we're going to talk about now is fat. Um, in your book, there's actually a chapter between uh, the oxidative phosphorylation chapter and the um, breaking down of fat for those of you following along in the book. Um, that is photosynthesis. Uh, we will skip that as we're going to mainly be focusing on animals metabolism here. So we're going to go right into breaking down triacylglycerols. We're going to learn about, about why LDL is bad for you. So first, let's do a little bit of review on our fatty acids, uh, triacylglycerols. If you don't remember what that is, that's how we carry around fats. You know, three carbons with fats. Actually, I should be uh, have some OHs. but it's, it's our way to just carry around fat, triacylglycerols, three fatty acid tails. And the problem with eating fats is that they are water insoluble. But we, as giant water balloons, are 70% water. So everything, all of our enzymes that digest food, they are water soluble. So how do you break down fatty acids then? Um, we have enzymes that work the best at where the interface between water and the lipids meet. So to break down fatty acids, um, we actually do it right at that interface. And the more of that interface there is, the bigger the surface area, the faster we can bring down fats. We can increase this surface area by the motion of the intestines, and if we have what are called bioacids. So bile acids, also known as bile salts, they'll be called, it, so if you see bile acid and bile salts, talking about the same exact thing. Uh, they are ampipathic detergent molecules. So in case you don't remember, ampipathic means as polar plus nonpolar regions. And so the way that we help to speed up the break it, breakdown of fat is that you, if you eat like a hamburger, I have told a lot of fat in there, uh, you're going to help break down these fat uh, globules by bringing them into my cells. And these bile acids, they're really made from cholesterol and they're uh, created in your liver and then they're transported to your gallbladder. And then during digestion, the gallbladder will put uh, these bile salts into the small intestine. And this is where the majority of lipid digestion and absorption takes place is in your small intestine. Um, this is where that uh, we are starting to increase the surface area of this lipid water interface and absorb that into the intestines. On the right here, that's just a picture of a uh, bile salt. Um, no, you can see cholesterol right here by the four rings. These are groups. They just tell you what could be on there. You don't need to memorize that structure or anything like that. So how do we actually break down these lipids at the lipid water interface? 
And it's by an enzyme called lipase. So lipase, again, if it ends in ACE, it's an enzyme, lip, lipid. So it's a lipid enzyme, right? And you're going to hydrolyze your fatty acid tails at position one and three. And you just created one, two diacylglycerol and a two acylglycerol. So you're going to cut them at positions one and three. Again, this only works really at the lipid water interface. And to really bind at that interface for this to really work, you need some micelles of photo uh, phosphatidyl choline and bile acids and a protein called collapsase. All collapsase is, is a helper protein that will bind to lipase. So you always have like one collapsase per lipase and they're working as a team. Um, but lipase is the enzyme that's doing the work. Lipase is the enzyme that's really um, cutting up these fatty acids for absorption into the small intestine. So that's what lipase is doing. So make sure you know the function there and you make sure you know uh, lipase really works at this lipid water interface. Now, how do we get the fatty acids into our cell then? Because remember, they are hydrophobic. We are hydrophilic. So that's a problem we have to overcome. And like I said, this is happening in the small intestine. And it's really these bile acids that are helping to absorb these digested products. Is that C1 and C3 of the glycerol head? Uh, yeah, I believe so. I believe that is what we are cutting. So you'll get like a, um, you'll get a fatty acid with oxygens attached to it. So it is completely um, chopping up your triacylglycerol. Right, so, so to absorb these fatty acids, like I said, you need these bile acids. And again, these bile acids, just like cholesterol-like molecules, that's helping the absorption of your fatty acids. And you're gonna form these micelles to help and move these lipid, these lipids into the cell. You also need micelles for vitamins as well, A, D, E, and K, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. This is mainly just for lipids. And when we have these fatty acids into the cells of the small intestine, they're going to bind with intestinal fatty acid binding protein. Uh, great name again, tells you exactly what it does. IFABP. This is a protein found in your cytoplasm. So again, the fatty acids have to be carried there to help and um, be dissolved in, in, in the cytoplasm, which is what these bile acids are really helping, helping happen. They're helping these fatty acids be dissolved. Once you're in the cytoplasm and you bind to this intestinal fatty acid binding protein, this is what that picture is showing here. So that protein right here is IFABP. And you can see this is like um, a little sandwich almost. You have 10 beta strands that's forming like a little cage because they're stacked on each other. And inside, the tail is interacting with the beta strands and some alpha helix. And the head group is interacting with uh, arginine and glutamine and water molecules. So this, this protein has been designed to work with a fatty acid, both the nonpolar part and the polar part. And what this does is that it not only makes sure that this fatty acid remains soluble, but it also is making sure your small intestines aren't being um, dissolved through detergent. Because remember, on the outside of your cell, you have a lipid bilayer. 
And what can happen is that if you have fatty acids, they can go and mess with the uh, uh, lipid bilayer. By mess, I mean destroy. So they can um, make your uh, plasmid bilayer become permeable, which will kill the cell. So we don't want that to happen, especially in your intestines, that would be really bad. So this kind of sequesters any lipids that, that have been brought in by those bio salts, uh, puts them in a nice little cage uh, so that they can be carried through the cell and deposited for their next step on their digestion journey. All right, so let me take a little break there and ask, so are there any questions so far? We're gonna look at a big overview of everything we're talking about. So um, if you're feeling a little lost on like, like where are we going from step to step to step, I have a good image that shows this, but um, let me just ask right now, any questions? Now that we have absorbed this fatty acid, this lipid, and it's in the small intestine, we need to get it to the rest of the body. And the way we transport fats and cholesterols in the body are through what are called lipo or lipoproteins. So lipid plus proteins equals the lipoprotein. And as you would expect, these are micelle-like particles. They're micelles because they have to interact with the nonpolar fatty acid. So inside the core, it's very hydrophobic of these proteins. These proteins have a very hydrophobic core where they store the triacylglycerols, lipids, and different uh, cholesterol. Then on the outside, you have um, phospholipids, you have proteins, you have the head groups of the cholesterol and cholesterol itself, um, amphiphilic, again, both polar and nonpolar, that helps to dissolve these in the blood and in the cells for transport. And this is how we're going to send, like I said, our lipids and our cholesterol all throughout the body. And you have different types of lipoproteins um, that do different things. Chylomicrons which have the smallest density. So chylo, So the way that this table goes, if you look on the bottom, let me just remark on that first. Um, it's low density to high density. Um, it's also largest to smallest. So your chylomicrons are the biggest, but they're less dense. And chylomicrons will go around the blood and deliver your triacylglycerols and your cholesterol for the body. While VLDL, IDL, LDL, HDL, so what do these words mean? Uh, so VL, very low, D, density, L, lipoprotein. So the D always stands for density. Yell is always lipoprotein. So very low, intermediate, low, and high. Why does intermediate come between very low and low? I don't know. It just does. So these are created by the liver, and you'll transport the tags you make in your body in the cholesterol you make in your body to different tissues. So chylomicrons are mainly used for when you eat stuff to bring those to different parts of your bodies. The other lipoproteins are used to transport from your liver to the other parts of your bodies. Um, HDL though, which is why it's called good cholesterol. HDL actually takes cholesterol and lipids from your cells back to your liver where they can be disposed of. So that's why LDL gets a wrap of bad cholesterol 
because that is going to deposit cholesterol or give cholesterol to other parts of your body. HDL is good because it takes it away from your body to go to your liver. So um, yeah, that's why doctors look at, you know, what's, what's your LDL ratio? What's your HDL ratio? The more HDL you have, the less of a chance to have, um, you know, plaque, cholesterol plaques build up. Questions about our lipoproteins. Um, and we're gonna get more, like I said, we're gonna look at LDL uh, specifically so you can get an image of this and we're gonna look at the big picture here soon, but any questions so far? All right. So here's the big picture I've been promising. I, I, this slide, there's a lot going on, but I find it a lot easier um, to um, understand what the previous slides are saying. So let's, let's walk through this. So let's say that you just had a big old slime ball of fat for lunch. You said, mm, lard sounds good today. I don't mind if I do. What happens there? Is that goes into the stomach as little lipid droplets because you can't dissolve that. They're hydrophobic. So they'll travel through the stomach and then your gallbladder will give these bile acids to your uh, intestines. Remember these bile acids made by the liver, but they are injected by the gallbladder. There in the small intestines, these bile acids will help to break down these large fat particles and they will form into micelles, which are shown here. These fatty acids will also be broken down at the one and three position. And they will be absorbed by the small intestine cells, which is going on in this picture. Yeah, there we go. Get that little marker out. Once in the small intestines, they will be packaged, and actually reformed in the triacylglycerols, and they'll be packaged in the chylomicrons. These chylomicrons are the biggest, less dense, and they are what is transferring from the intestines into the bloodstream to be deposited into either your fat tissue or your muscle tissue, any place that needs uh, energy. So one second here. Sorry. So we take our chylomicrons and they're traveling through the blood. In your blood, you have lipoprotein lipase. What lipoprotein lipase is, is they're enzymes that will break down these chylomicrons and just remove the lipids from these chylomicrons. And it's these lipids that can go to your muscle cells or your fat tissue. So the chylomicrons lose lipids, lose lipids, lose lipids, lose lipids as they travel throughout the body until the only thing that's really left is cholesterol. So you have these uh, chylomicron uh, remnants that are just chock full of cholesterol now. And these will go to your liver. So the cholesterol is delivered to your liver. Inside your liver, this cholesterol can be packaged into VLDL, very low density lipoproteins. Any cholesterol that you make as well will be packaged in the VLDL. As, and some other lipids as well. So you'll have lipids, cholesterol, and protein in VLDL. This is sent from your liver back into the bloodstream. And the process happens again, where a lipoprotein lipase will start chopping off the uh, lipids and deposit them into the adipose tissue or the muscle cells. This will break down, break down, break down, so they'll become smaller, smaller, smaller until they're in IDL form. Once you're in IDL, 
you have two choices. One, you go back to the liver to get destroyed and then send out again as VDL, or you keep losing proteins to become LDL. LDL can also go back to the liver. And so this 50%, what this 50% says is that 50% of all IDL goes back to the liver either as IDL or LDL. The other 50%, which remember at this point is high in cholesterol because we have lost a lot of lipids already. So we're, we're high in cholesterol here. That goes to other cells to deliver that cholesterol. And HCL, that is the opposite of LDL. So LDL delivers cholesterol. HCL will take that cholesterol from cells and they do it right on the cell surface. So any cholesterol that's on the cell surface, HCL can come up and pick that up, bring it back to the liver. And at the liver, that can actually get rid of cholesterol um, by turning them into bile acids because bile acids are made from cholesterol. Uh, different um, uh, hormones are also cholesterol based. So that's another way uh, to use this excess cholesterol. But this image in a nutshell tells you how we go from food to delivering the lipids and then how we can actually deal with the lipids and cholesterol we make and how that's delivered and handled in the bloodstream and the different cells and all the proteins. Well, very basic overview of the proteins used in this, in this pathway. Okay, so looking at this picture, Hearing that explanation, what questions do you have at the top of your brain right now? Or is it one, one of those situations where you just need to look at this picture a little bit more to generate those questions? And then you'll come back with questions later because this one, one image has a lot of information on it. Yeah, I figured you would need to look at it more. So uh, definitely, you know, this this is one of those images that, I mean, not for test two, but for test three. Um, this explains basically everything I just said in the last slides. So if you can like explain what is going on in this image, um, that's that's a good test for you to know, you know, do I understand? what's going on in this whole process. So keep coming back to this image. Um, keep looking at it. If you get confused, have questions, for sure, email me and I will um, help you walk through this again. Because every time I teach this class, um, it takes me a solid like five minutes to look at this, this slide and remember like what is going on again, because it's very complex. So make sure you're, you digitally ear, earmark this slide. But let's talk about LDL. All right, so this image, and I'm just gonna go back right here. What we're gonna look at next is how LDL is absorbed by the liver. How do, how do we recycle this LDL? So that's what this next slide looks at. And again, this is another one of those uh, big image slides. It's gotta get all pen mode. And raise that mark. All right, so how do we absorb that LDL? All right, let's walk through this. So this is basically the liver, or it could actually be um, other cells as well. But what happens is that you have an LDL particle and you have a protein sticking off this low density lipoprotein called ApoB. And inside LDL, you have a bunch of cholesterol, some lipids, and a lot of amino acids as well. So ApoB is on the outside of LDL. We'll look at this on the next slide, I believe I talk about this more in depth. So to be absorbed by any cell, that cell needs to be showing LDL receptors. 
And these LD re L receptors are proteins that bind to ApoAB. That's being shown right here where our receptor is binding to ApoB. Once you have bound to ApoB, you have this protein clathrin, which we briefly talked about all the way back at the end of Biochem 1. Um, clathrin is just a protein. Think of it like a cage almost, where this clathrin will come and form a cage around the LDL receptors that have bound to ApoB, and they will pinch off that LDL and form a vesicle. So that's going on with picture two. The clathrin surrounds our vesicle or surrounds our, our LDL receptor that is connected to ApoB to make a vesicle. Once we are in our vesicle, clathrin's job is done. So we can remove the clathrin from our vesicle. That's step three. And clathrin can go and make another vesicle um, with more LDL receptors. So we can just recycle that. Its job is done. It's made our vesicle. But to continue on to break down this LDL particle, we bind with an endosome. Now, an endosome is very acidic, pH of around five. And what this does, once the pH drops to five, the LDL receptors will be removed from our vesicle and kind of butt off. That's going on in step five. We have our, our um, receptors budding off and they can go and return and they're recycled back. So they can go and bind to another ApoB protein. But to continue the breakdown of this LDL particle, we then add a lysosome. And what the lysosome will do is that it will chop up LDL. It will just break it down into its individual parts. Those individual parts are amino acids, fatty acids, and cholesterol. And so the amino acids and fatty acids will be ejected. They can be used by the cells as energy or whatever. They have a lot of uses, but they're kicked out of the lysosome. And we're going to continue what happens with the cholesterol now. So that's going on in step eight. Once we lose the fatty acids and amino acids by the lysosome, the cholesterol can move on. And cholesterol has two fates. One fate of some of the cholesterol is shown in step nine. Some of that cholesterol is converted into cholesterol esters via a protein called ACAT. Um, and what ACAT does is actually uh, speeds up forming cholesterol in the ethers. So some of these cholesterols you just uh, create into an ether, uh, ester, ester, can't speak right now to an ester, you can use those for different processes. So these can be shipped off to different parts of the cell for different, you know, make hormones, uh, make bile acids, whatever. Some of the other cholesterol though, goes directly to the ER. And the reason they go to the ER is because this cholesterol is a signal. Once the ER once the cholesterol goes to the ER, they do a couple of things. One, they trigger um, the, the decrease of HMG-CoA reductase. What is that? So that's explained down here. HMG-CoA reductase is the enzyme that is the rate limiting step for making cholesterol. So what this says, is that if you eat cholesterol, some of that goes to the ER, which turns off you making cholesterol, which makes sense. If you just ate it, why would you need to make more of it? So turn that off. You also shut off your LDL receptor. So 
once your liver has gotten cholesterol, it will stop making LDL receptors and stop intaking that cholesterol. And it will also increase ACAT. So any cholesterol we still have around can be used um, in biosynthesis, basically. So this can actually prevent a problem, which we'll talk about on Tuesday, as after this image, I'm sure you have enough to chew on. Um, but one of the problems with LDL is that it creates plaques on your blood vessels. So one of the ways to get rid of those plaques is if the cholesterol goes to the liver in the first place, because the liver is very good at taking care of cholesterol, like we said. However, once the liver has enough cholesterol, you stop uptaking it into the liver, and then the cholesterol still remains in your body, has nowhere to go. And we'll see on Tuesday how that turns into plaques. It's basically your white blood cells. Um, seeing, seeing these, they eat all the fat and the uh, cholesterol, and they accidentally kill themselves. Which brings more fatty, which brings more white blood cells to eat the fat and cholesterol, and then they kill themselves, and it's just a cycle. But that's something covered for Tuesday. And I think I'm sure right now, if you've been paying attention, um, you are probably feeling a little bit overwhelmed because those two last images have a ton of information on them. One is how the fatty acids go through the body. Two is how we absorb LDL. Oops. So you wonder if people with ACAP protein mutations have hyperlipidemia. I do not know. That's a very good question. Um, if you'd like to find out and show me like a reference for that, I'll be happy to award anybody with extra credit because I have no idea about that. Yeah, do a Google Scholar search, search, uh, Google Scholar search and uh, look, look that up. And as it, and I'll say, I don't, I don't have, I don't think it'll be an issue here, but I'll say it anyways. Just make sure it's, it's a good source, right? Not like, I don't know naturalhealth.org or something like that. Like, like I said, I don't think it's a problem for you guys um, and gals because at this point in your career, you know a good source from a bad source, but just want to throw that out there. Um, but yeah, with that, that's, that's all the time we have for today. Hope you learned something interesting. Um, I'll put a homework up just to cover some of the things we have gone over. We'll pick this up on Tuesday, test next week, Thursday. As always, when when looking over this stuff, again, this fast stuff's on test three, so don't worry about it too much for right now. You got other things to study for, but if studying anything um, and something doesn't make sense, always feel free to email me. Otherwise, hope you have a good weekend and I hopefully will see people next week. Have a good one, everyone.